much for uh, that wonderful introduction and for being here today. I'm thrilled to watch my slides move without touching the computer. Uh, so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about kind of a winding path to what I call digital literacy. Uh, I want to acknowledge all the past Richard Snow Award recipients. It's, it's an esteemed list, a, a list of just luminaries in our field, people whose work I have admired, who I have leaned upon, who I've looked to for inspiration. Um, so it's, it's just really humbling to be listed among them. So thank you uh, to the committee and to Division 15. My understanding is that this talk is supposed to be kind of a little bit research and a little bit kind of like my career path, kind of. So I'm going to try to weave those two things together. We'll see how I do. Buckle up. Um, so, you know, uh, I began uh, as a small child and, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's going to be a little while. Uh, born in the suburbs of Philadelphia where I often as a child planned, monitored, controlled, and evaluated my days, uh, regulating my way away, uh, days away. Um, in class and outside of class, I sought knowledge, including how to understand, justify, change, and use it. Um, often questioning my sources in a very <laughs> epistemically informed and confident way. Um, and, you know, I made use of multiple sources of information, including the triumvirate of authoritative sources in the 1980s, Encyclopedia Britannica, MTV, and pre-internet bulletin boards. So, um, of course, I am joking. Uh, I was not nearly... Um, any of those things, but all of those things are important. And in all seriousness, uh, those ways of thinking, self-regulation, epistemic cognition, using multiple sources, are incredibly important today. They always have been, but they're even more important today. As Greg talked about in terms of science issues, um, in terms of what I would call digital literacy, if you look at the numbers, in 2016, for the first time, people reported using online social media news sources more than they reported using newspapers. People are going online for knowledge and information. And the information online is proliferating, it's getting more and more frequent, there's more of it out there, and not all of it is super great. I don't know if you know this, but some of the information online isn't maybe super trustworthy. Um, today's students are not digital natives, right? That's what the research would bear out. They can use Facebook, they can use web browsers, but learning online and being critical online is much more difficult. It's not innate, it's not intuitive, it has to be learned. And that's why I like studying it, because I think it's a challenge. Um, just to give you an example of this, so this is a Google search I did a couple days ago. And I use that cool private browser feature, you know, so it doesn't allow any of the Google to see any of your cookies. So this is what, what might pop up if a regular student was given what some teachers call a web quest, right? Like, go online and learn about Martin Luther King, and most students will Google it first, right? So a little blurry, but at the top, there's Wikipedia. Wikipedia is always at the top, right? But many teachers tell their students either don't trust Wikipedia or don't just trust Wikipedia, right? So we could go down this list and look at these websites. Um, I want to point out the one on the bottom, martinlutherking.org, right? It's a .org. Many people think .orgs are, it's not a .com, it's not commercial, it's not trying to sell me anything, you know, maybe it's a nonprofit or it's reputable. martinlutherking.org is a KKK site. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to click on it. Um, but if you were to click on it, uh, it doesn't say at the top, we are a KKK site, right? It's, it's designed to try to fool people. It's designed to try to suck people in and give them what they call the quote-unquote truth of Martin Luther King Jr. So online information is sometimes dangerous, right? It's sometimes um, not reliable. And we really need students to develop the skills to be critical about what they're encountering online. And that's a big part of what I would call digital literacy. And there's a number of ways in which we can teach literacy and we can try to adjust your slides so you can see your notes. There's a number of ways to do that. Hey, it worked. Uh, one of those ways uh, is through some work that I'm doing with Karen Murphy involving an intervention called Quality Talk. And that's where um, we go into classrooms, we put students in small groups for discourse, uh, we directly train and coach teachers to teach discourse to students, we teach the students themselves explicitly how to ask good questions, provide good responses, that allows them to engage in the kinds of argumentation that builds those critical thinking skills. Um, it's work I'm really proud of. I think it's very interesting. I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, there's just too much to talk about. Karen's much better at it than I am. Um, but that work is akin to the work that I do that involves digital literacy. So I'm going to tease you with this and then talk to you about something else. 
Um, when we think about digital literacy, when I think about it, I really think it is at the nexus of three large areas in educational psychology. Uh, the first of those is self-regulated learning, right, which I've already mentioned. And when you self-regulate, that's where you plan, monitor, control, evaluate your learning. It's where you have a natural response. And there are times where that natural response needs to be inhibited, where you, that's not the best way to go, is you've got to kind of do something unnatural. You need to inhibit that and replace it with a more thoughtful and effortful response. And learners that are able to know when to do that and do it successfully tend to be more successful learners. So we like students to do that. Uh, and there's a number of luminaries in the field that have really done seminal work here. Barry Zimmerman, Dale Shump, Phil Winnie, Roger Azevedo, all kinds of folks that are really important. This area also involves something I call epistemic cognition, uh, which is, again, how people pursue academic, uh, how they acquire, understand, justify, change, and use knowledge in formal and informal contexts. You know what's really great about technology is that when you have an Apple Watch and someone calls you, it buzzes you like it does like right now. Like it's buzzing right now. It's not distracting at all. So uh, epistemic cognition, oh good, they hung up. So epistemic cognition happens to me all the time. Uh, there's a large field that's growing at epistemic cognition. Greg's doing some really fascinating work. And by the way, kudos, like super clear presentation. Like wow, like very clear. Good for you. That was great. Um, no pressure at all from me. I really appreciate that, Greg. Thanks so much. Um, and I'm going to set you up nicely. Don't worry, because I don't make any sense. Uh, so uh, there's a number of people in epistemic cognition whose work has been really influential to me. Barbara Hofer, Clark Chin. Uh, Ivar Broughton and other people, that's a big area of research and it's growing um, and is in good hands. Um, and then there's this uh, kind of burgeoning area of research called multiple source use that has deep roots in text comprehension and understanding text and as we move on to try to understand how students understand across texts and integrate their texts. It's a really fascinating area. Rue, Britt, McCrudden, um, all these people are doing really fascinating work there. And I think in kind of the middle of all of this, um, all three of these things which are not innate which are not easy, which are not natural, have to be learned, is digital literacy, right? So I think all three of those things are really necessary to be a good online learner. And the question is, how can we get students to grab these things, integrate them, and kind of um, adopt them as their own? And that's what I like to study. And that might seem fairly linear, it might feel hopefully feels fairly straightforward, um, but the reality is that getting to here was not at all linear. And getting here was not at all straightforward. Um, and so I want to kind of talk to you about kind of how I got to this point and what that might mean um, for folks that might be doing something similar. So I have a couple pieces of advice that you can take or leave. Um, but the first one is that not all who wander are lost, right? So um, despite my joke at the beginning of the presentation, I did not have clear academic goals. I didn't have clear social goals. I didn't have a clear direction. I thought at one point, I was going to be a clinical psychologist, which for those of you that know me would have been a terrible idea. I, just, I don't help people, I, I need clinical psychologists. I um, at one point, I thought I was going to be a college administrator, right? So that was kind of my career. So I was kind of all over the place. I didn't do a great job of planning my learning or studying effectively, right? So in college, I played way too much Ultimate Frisbee. Not very well, but I still played it. I probably should have been studying, but I, I didn't. Uh, you know, I had a fixed mindset, so uh, I liked math in high school, I took Calc 2 in college, I got a C, and it was like, well, that's it, I'm out of Calc, forget it, no more math, and I went into psychology. Um, you know, but throughout all of this wandering, I kept my eyes open, right? I tried to look for the opportunities and recognize them when they came, uh, I came upon them, and tried to capitalize upon them the best way I could. I paid attention to what was going on, and thought about what was going on, and tried to pivot accordingly. And so I think it's, it's great to wander. Most of us are wandering, but you've got to pay attention while you do it because opportunities will rise, and when they do, you need to capitalize upon them. And um, one way in which I was wandering was I wandered my way into my first master's degree and, people, and met people who really changed my life. And I want to talk about those people that changed my life, and that's my second point. Call it a clan, call it a network, call it a tribe, call it a family, whatever you call it. Whoever you are, you need one. Right, so um, that's what I found at the University of Maryland, where I went to graduate school. I found people who helped me understand what I wanted to do. Thank you. And uh, go Terps, fear the turtle, all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, ACC forever, sorry. Um, uh, but there were a number of really important mentors at Maryland that I want to talk to you about. Um, but the first thing I want to note is that I was lucky to consult multiple sources. Right? There were many good people there, and they were all incredibly influential to me. 
And the first one I'll talk about is Patricia Alexander. Um, Patricia's been a huge influence upon my life, and I'm really grateful for that because I was a moron the first time I met her. So I was uh, working at Maryland and thought, like, maybe I want to go back and get a PhD in educational psychology. Who has a good program? Oh, Maryland does. I guess I'll walk over and see what's up. And so I walked over to the ed psych department, and Patricia was there, and I kind of said, hey, can we talk about ed psych? And she said, sure, which was great and super nice. Um, and I actually had a friend that was in this program, um, and his advice was terrible because he said, don't work with Pat, she works people too hard. And so at the end of our talk, Patricia's like, well, you know, what you want to study sounds really interesting. Um, when you apply, go ahead and put me down as the person you want to be your advisor. And I went, nah. <laughs> that, was, that was smart, right? That's, that's an opportunity. Um, now, thankfully, she has forgiven me for that, I think. Um, and she, but she's been, I mean, just so generous and just a real, um, her influence upon my thinking and my work has been unmeasurable. Um, epistemology tells us that knowledge is defeasible. I'm not sure Pat is, right? I think she's, she's almost always right. Um, and I didn't understand reasoning, evidence, or justification in psychology until Patricia taught me. And it was really important that she did, right? And that leads me to my third point. You gotta learn the rules before you can break them. So a lot of folks come in and they want to change everything. That's great, but you've got to know what you're changing first. Um, and this is an issue of epistemic cognition, right? What are the norms and practices in your discipline? So, um, you know, beliefs are really important, but to engage in critique, you've got to understand how knowledge is created. How does knowing occur? Um, and in the epistemic cognition literature, um, things like justification are really important, and that was something that should have helped me explore in my dissertation and that we talked about um, in some articles. And so when we, and there's a handbook out that I think is kind of neat that hopefully you might want to check out, but in that handbook, I wrote a chapter in which we talked about things called epistemic systems, right? And psychology is an epistemic system. And what that means is it's an organization or group of people that produces knowledge claims. And everyone else observes psychology and decides whether or not they want to kind of believe, quote unquote, what psychology is telling them. Right? So as educational psychologists, we have some responsibility to make sure that our epistemic system is producing as good a claims as can be possible. Right? We want our knowledge claims to be solid and supported. They don't always have to be quote unquote right. They don't always have to stand the test of time. As Greg talked about, knowledge changes and evolves. But to the degree possible, we need to make sure that our norms and practices make us a reliable system for knowledge. People can come to us and trust us. Um, and what's startling to me is how some recent events in psychology, and that hum isn't distracting at all either, um, some recent events in psychology have caused people to question whether or not psychology itself is a reliable epistemic system. That's a problem, right? We need to worry about that. It's causing some of a moral panic. Um, so some of you might be familiar with the reproducibility crisis or the replication crisis, right? So um, some psychologists tried to replicate or reproduce some prominent findings in the field and they didn't find as many replications as they expected. This led to a lot of hubbub in the New York Times and Nature and Vox and all these kind of public and social areas about kind of what do we do about maybe psychology is broken, maybe it doesn't work, maybe we should stop paying attention to psychology. Um, listen. Not every study that gets published in psychology is a winner, right? I mean, we've all read bad studies in good journals. It happens, right? But on the whole, when you look at the totality of what psychology produces, it produces good work. It produces work that helps us make better decisions about our lives. It helps us be more successful than we would be if it was not there. It is a good epistemic system, but we have to remember that it's a system, right? I think what's problematic is it's very seductive to have your work kind of identified by popular press and then the popular press wants you to stretch it. They want you to stretch your conclusions. They say like, well, you're using a lot of tentative language. You know, can't we just say that refutational texts attack people's identity and so therefore they need to work on their identity? Great, can't we just, can you just pull that conclusion just a little further? And that's what gets us into trouble. And it shouldn't be surprising that when we make claims that are stretched beyond what we know is reasonable given one study, that that could come back and bite us. And when we rely upon uh, multimedia and social media to proliferate our findings without appropriate acknowledgement of their defeasibility, I think we get kind of in a gotcha situation. And we shouldn't just be surprised when that happens. Um, and one reason why that occurs is because I think um, popular press and society sometimes wants us to have a fairly myopic view 
of how research works. Some of you may be familiar with p-values and how p-values work, and there's this magical, if your p-value is less than 0.05, then everything's fantastic, and you should run around the room and set off fireworks. Um, there are some scientists that are now saying that we should change that p-value to from 0.05 to 0.005, Ooh. right? Um, now, thankfully, there's been some pushback. This doesn't make any sense to me, right? Like, the number doesn't matter. Right? Do p-values matter? Yes. Are they, only, are they the only thing that matters? No. Right? Good science, a good epistemic system, relies upon more than p-values. And we need to think about that when we're making claims. So, um, as Patricia taught me, a good claim depends upon at least a six-legged stool. That's the closest I could get to six-legged stool, so hang in there with me. Um, but Patricia told me that when you make a knowledge claim in psychology, and you make an inference from that, it's got to be built upon good theory, right? So there's got to be theory behind it to suggest that this makes sense. Um, you've got to understand the context. Claims are made with certain samples and certain kinds of scenarios, with certain kinds of measures, etc. Um, the research design really matters. We all know that correlation doesn't mean causation necessarily. We have to be careful about that. Um, measurement really matters, as we know. And um, if we're not measuring things effectively, then who cares what we're finding? Everything else is kind of moot. Um, analysis matters, and then internal and external coherence all matter, right? So the study has to make sense within itself, and it's got to kind of make sense with everything else that's out there. And when we make a knowledge claim as an epistemic system, when we say people should do X, ideally we should have some support across most, if not all, of these factors. And there's maybe other ones that folks would come up with. Um, it's really hard for one study to do this. It's hard for one study to kind of hit or check all these boxes. It's just not reasonable. Um, and when we condemn a field based upon one study, or we laud a field based upon one study, we are tempting fate. We are um, stretching our claims perhaps farther than they should be stretched. And so um, we shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised when one study fails to replicate. That's not the point. The point is, across a number of studies, a different ways of doing things, what does the field say about us? Um, and this is a student doing what's called a think aloud protocol. This is research that I do. Um, and I know that one study alone doesn't hold enough water to really support a lot of knowledge claims. When I do think aloud protocols, I ask students to sit down in front of a computer and talk aloud as they use it, right? And um, they do that for maybe a half hour or 40 minutes. And I get, you know, 15, 20 pages of transcript of what they're thinking and doing as they're doing it. It's fabulous data. It's rich. It's wonderful. It's a pain in the behind. It's six hours of coding, right, per participant. It's 60 or more codes per participant, right? It's a huge resource drain. It'd be great to just hand them a survey and be like, survey, what do you think? Surveys have a role, but this tells me something more about what they're actually doing, how they're doing it, and the sequence. Um, and I know that the resources demand to, demand to um, capture think aloud protocols mean I have to have smaller sample sizes, which means my p-values might be kind of wonky. I don't just look at the p-values, right? I look at effect sizes, I look at relations, I look at theory. If I just relied on p-values, I'd be really depressed and probably not talking to you right now because I wouldn't have published anything, right? So it takes more than just p-values to really make a field. And I think we need to educate ourselves and others about how the work is done. It's okay to break the rules, but you've got to understand how the work is done first. And our epistemic system is strong when we understand how that work is done in a more holistic way than just focusing on a p-value or just focusing on one study. So Patricia taught me that. And all of that rigor that she taught dovetailed really nicely with another opportunity that popped up for me during my doctoral program and brings me to the second mentor I want to talk about, Greg Hancock. So Greg was my um, stats advisor, right? So when I was in the EdSci program, after about a year or two, they created this dual degree program where as you got your PhD in Ed Psych, you could get a master's in measurement, statistics, and evaluation. And I decided to do that despite my fixed mindset about math. Thank goodness I kind of got over that. Um, Greg was my advisor in that program. He's also quite simply the most gifted teacher I've ever encountered. Um, sitting in Greg's stats class is great because it's just kind of like epiphanies all day long. Like you just see like all these people that never thought they could understand statistics. You're like, oh, that's what it is. Now it makes sense. It's really fantastic to watch. And Greg stressed for me my fourth point or little recommendation, and that's methods matter. How we do the work really does matter. Um, and 
I'll be honest with you, there wasn't a great graphic that had the words Methods Matter on it, so I just grabbed this one. Um, but I will say, this is a great book. If you haven't read this book, it's really, really good. Um, but uh, methods and learning how to engage in the methods of the work, which is an issue of epistemic cognition, is kind of like courtship. That's a little dark, unfortunately, um, but that's from um, uh, PhD comics, basically comparing the PhD process to a marriage, right? And kind of the courtship process for a marriage. Um, and the point I want to make here is deciding to go into the MA program extended my PhD program. And there's costs to that. There's resource costs, there's time costs, there's personal costs. But I firmly believe that we need to invest in methods. And we need to invest in teaching our students methods. Um, I understand that we want to have short time degree and we want students to have practical research experience and specialization and all that's really, really important. But our students need to know how to do the work. And, and that takes, I think, coursework in addition to experience. Um, this applies whether we're talking about quantitative research, qualitative research, or mixed methods research. And I just want to give you a quick example of how things are going. And actually, Greg, again, it's like we had like some kind of mind meld because you presented a um, moderated mediation model. I'm going to produce, produce a mediated moderation model. So, <laughs> nice. So, um, it doesn't matter what the actual variables are. That doesn't matter. The theoretical literature, the empirical liter literature that I'm referring to, points to this model. If you read it all, it says very specific, I mean, like it's just kind of plain as day that there's some kind of treatment at the top there that we think affects learning outcomes on the right. And there's an individual difference variable that we think might moderate the effect of the treatment. Some students might be more affected by the treatment than others, right? And so that variable matters. That's not static, by the way. We can change. I don't believe in individual differences that are static. But you know, when, what you come in with on that does matter. So there's a moderation or interaction effect there affecting learning outcomes. But all of that can be mediated by a particular experience during the treatment. So that's a mediated moderation model. Why hasn't this ever been tested? Why hasn't anyone ever done it? I think because it's kind of hard, right? Like the statistics are not easy. It's not a, you can't do a regression and figure this out, right? But we've got to teach people how to do this. And I worry about stats programs that say like, take two methods courses and you're good, right? I think we need more than that. And we have to make the commitment to try to get our students more opportunities to learn about methods. Again, quantitative, qualitative, or mixed. It really helped me, and I think it's gonna really help our field moving forward. What I worry is that by only requiring students to take one or two methods courses, we're teaching them how to use a printing press in a laptop world. So I think we have to kind of come to grips with that. And then don't get me started on like measurement and instrument development and randomized control designs. I mean, all this stuff's really complicated too. I think we need to get there. Which brings me to my fifth mentor, uh, my next mentor, and my fifth point, Judith Tony Perla. So um, Judith was my first um, doctoral advisor in my program. And thank goodness, after the terrible decision of telling Patricia no, uh, I said, yeah, uh, Judith was kind enough to offer to be my advisor, and I took her up on that. Judith was just an amazing mentor. She taught me how to think like an academic, how to express myself like an academic. She taught me um, just what it meant to do scholarship. I mean, she's just an eminent scholar, just a, you know, kind of a, a paradigmatic scholar in the field. She taught me how to write, how to think, um, and then how to care for students by being tough, honest, and fair, right? And that was really important. And this is an issue of self-regulation. It's not easy to give people feedback, particularly critical feedback. It's not, that's not something that most people naturally are like, yay, I'm going to go tell someone what they're doing wrong. That's not a natural, I mean, some people have that natural response and we don't like those people. Uh, <laughs> but uh, most people, like, that's kind of a hard thing to do. But Judith was really good at it and she was um, able to do that with me. And one example of that is writing. So uh, again, a little blurry, but this is just a random piece of paper with, you know, scribbles all over it. I think probably most of us have gotten a piece of paper back like that. I mean, my students have gotten papers like this back from me. Um, you know, when I was coming up through K through 12, I was a good writer. My 12th grade English teacher wrote at the top of my paper, Jeff, please become an English teacher so you can teach people to write like you. I was like, yes. Right? So I was playing ultimate frisbee in college, maybe should have been in the library more, but I always could fall back on my writing. I got to my doctoral program, had my first class with Judith, I handed my paper and I thought, this is going to be great. And I got it back and there was one thing written on it at the very top. You have a lot of work to do. <laughs> right? And she met with me and talked to me about it and explained it and worked me through it. 
Um, and it was, it was so important. I didn't love the feedback at the time, right? But it was incredibly important. And she did it honestly, and she did it fairly, and she did it thinking about me. She gave me that feedback to help me get better. And that's one thing that she taught me that was really important for us as, for those of us that are giving feedback to students to self-regulate and kind of get over that kind of, ooh, I don't want to give critical feedback. It's so important. I really benefited from it. I think students do too. And as a learner, we need to self-regulate too. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, there's a handbook coming out that has all kinds of interesting things on it, hopefully. Um, but self-regulation relates to what some people call the marshmallow test. You might be familiar with this, right? It's, it's about kind of putting off what might feel natural and good at the moment for some kind of long-term reward that's more valuable and more desired. And as students, we need to do that. Um, and listen to that buzzing again. Um, and what my research would suggest is self-regulation is really important, but it is variable. It does vary by individual and context and domain, and we need to pay attention to that. And I think we run into a little bit of trouble in the SRL literature uh, when we say to students, this is the best way to self-regulate, always this way. It's just not that simple. There are certain times where certain procedures are needed. There are certain people that have to do things one way versus a different way. It's more nuanced than that. And if we really want students to self-regulate, we need to teach them to know how to do it themselves. And when we just tell students, like, do it this way, we're not teaching them how to self-regulate. We're kind of giving them a fish instead of teaching them how to fish, that whole thing. Um, so we need to learn how to help people adapt, be thoughtful and adapt. And that brings me to my um, fourth mentor and my sixth and last, last point, promise. Um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard, right? And uh, learning how to self-regulate and learning how to be critical and learning how to reflect requires hard work. And someone who taught me the value of hard work is Roger Azevedo, right? He was my, um, another one of my academic advisors. Like I told you, I had like a million academic advisors. It really, it, it, took, an, it took a whole village. Um, I took Roger's class. I learned about self-regulated learning. I loved it. Um, I begged to join his lab. He made the foolish decision to say yes. Um, and let me tell you, in that lab, I learned how to do research. I learned how to write papers. I learned how to do presentations. I learned how to do all these things that we do here at APA. Um, and it was hard. Roger was demanding. I mean, but he demanded of his students just as much as he demanded of himself. And he was incredibly supportive as long as you did the work. He was interested in training self-regulated academics. And he taught me how to do that. And that hard work has really paid off in terms of expertise, which is the last thing I want to talk about. Um, he had to develop, he had to be on the path to expertise in his lab. Um, and it's one of the things that requires is really knowing your literature. And I'll never forget, he said to me, you're in grad school, you might feel busy. Now is the time when you get to read. You have time to read now. He's like, I hardly have any time to actually read the literature. I have to do it like over breakfast, like cereal and articles and that kind of thing. And I have found that to be the case, that the day-to-day -day demands of the field and being a professor can make it hard to get back to the basics of what makes us experts, and that's reading the literature. But we have to get time for that. To be an expert, you've got to know what's going on, not just when you were in grad school, but what's happened since you were in grad school. And that requires, again, self-regulation. So um, self-regulation enables experts to be their own coach. Um, and we're doing some fascinating research in art and design classrooms, um, helping students who are already competent artists become expert, comp uh, expert artists. And one of the things we're finding is that self-regulation is really the key. And that what they're self-regulating and how they're self-regulating is not necessarily how we think about it in the literature. So that's a little tease. Um, hopefully we'll be reading more about that soon. Um, but expertise really requires vigilance. It's kind of like, you know, the day you stop pushing yourself is the day that you start getting um, worse. So uh, my students and I have a research group where we're studying all these things, self-regulated learning, epistemic cognition, multiple source use. I think that all undergirds digital literacy, but I'd say it also undergirds career literacy. That to have a good career, you've got to be engaged in these things. I hope I've made that clear. Um, so, you know, not all who wander are lost. Keep your eyes open. That's SRL. Surround yourself with good people and ask them for help. Multiple source use. Learn how the work is done. Epistemic cognition. Methods matter. Epistemic cognition. Care. Tough. Honest. Fair. Self-regulated learning. Work hard. Plan. Push yourself. Self-regulated learning. So there's the theme. There's the graph, you know, the overall organizer for you. So as I wrap up, I want to thank my friends who are now colleagues, or colleagues who are now friends. Um, there's way too many of you. 
uh, to identify, and I'm terrified I'll forget one of you, but I truly value our conversations and time together. Um, I learn far more from you than I could ever hope to expect. Um, I want to thank all my student collaborators. It is a joy and an honor to work with all of you every day, um, and I learn a ton, and it's just the best job in the world to get to spend time with you. And my family, there they are. Um, yeah, so we'll let that go. You know, it's just, yeah.